Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to the Blender Hangout for this evening. So glad you're here and tuned in. And uh, tonight we're gonna be working on some really fun stuff. So uh, new concepts, still sticking with the same 3D illustration that we've been working on uh, for the past three weeks or so, but there's a new model we're working on tonight. And so uh, we're gonna jump into Photoshop. I'm gonna kind of catch you up on what I've been working on the past day or so. And then we will hopefully towards the end, jump into Blender and get into uh, some more sculpting, concepting, things like that. So uh, before we do that, real quick, I want to uh, kind of share with you guys, if you haven't seen this before, quickly get this up. For anybody new here, um, I have a website that I've just started. So if you check this out, you can see we are at theorangeguild.com. So I do have a separate YouTube channel for this, but um, this is my company and it's sort of all built around Blender training for you guys. So if you go to theorangeguild.com, you can sign up for a free account, click the little subscribe button, join the newsletter, uh, and then sign up for free. And then that will take you to a screen where you can create a free account. There are gonna be free training. I do free streams that are for guild members only. So those are exclusive and you can find those in the guild. And uh, we just added that to the guild as of last Saturday. So if you jump in here to the training section, you can see that you go to the live stream hangouts, click that. And once you have signed up for free, you'll be able to jump in here and watch all the live streams as recordings or even jump in live and see them as we go. So I'll be sending out emails to people and letting them know when that happens. And also we have a lot of other training that's available, more coming out. Uh, and we're working hard on that for you guys. So definitely check that out and sign up for that. And tonight, let's get into our project. So if you check the screen out here, you can see what we were working on last Friday night. So if you were tuned in, you can see uh, some of the concepts we're working on. And just to give you a better idea of the kind of thing that we're building here, I'm gonna pull over my Pinterest page. So this is my other uh, account for Blender Unleashed, which is my other Blender blog. And I have lots of boards here that are created for reference. And this particular project we're working on is called the Atlantean Amulet. And that's the uh, illustration I've been working on this month. So tonight we're starting to work on this pipe. And the pipe that we're creating is something that is made out of a mineral called sepia light, or it's often called Meerschaum which is the German word for sea foam. And so these are hand carved. Uh, they look a lot like um, the scrimshaw sort of things that you would see on a bone for like a whale's bone. And uh, that's the kind of pipe that we're creating. So the idea is to create something that is unique and different that we haven't seen before, kind of fits in the theme of our overall uh, illustration this month. And uh, while we're on that, because I know some of you are uh, tuned in and haven't been keeping up with where we are, so I wanna share that with you. Let me jump over to uh, the project for this month. So give me just a second to pull this up. Okay. So this is uh, the latest render from our uh, 3D illustration that we're working on this month and the pipe will fit somewhere uh, over here or possibly over here in the scene. So uh, there's a lot going on here. And if you are interested in seeing any of these uh, things being modeled, you can check that out on any of the past streams on my personal channel, uh, which if you're watching live right now, then you know what channel you should be on. Uh, so subscribe for the channel to see the rest of those and uh, know when I go live next, hit that little bell notification. Uh, to see when that happens. So if we zoom in here, uh, you can see a lot of detail. So let me uh, kind of get this zoomed in for you. Okay, I'm gonna actually open this up in Photoshop. A little easier to mess with than the Windows preview. Okay, so if we zoom in here, you can see uh, all the detail that we've added in and lots of objects to check out here uh, that we've seen on the streams. I actually showed how to paint this map up last Saturday in a five hour stream. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check out that in the Orange Guild. 
And uh, yeah, so you can see all the detail that we've uh, sort of been working on here. All right, so moving on to tonight's project. So Friday night, we sketched up a bunch of silhouettes that you can see here. Uh, out of these, we decided to pick two to sort of work on. And uh, these were the two that we decided to work up. And so towards the end of the stream, we got these ready and sort of painted over in a rough format. Uh, so we could take a look at what those might look like with a sort of grayscale rendition. And um, right after this, I sort of decided I needed to figure out what direction I wanted to head with the project. And I wasn't feeling too excited about uh, the ship here because it, it didn't really feel like uh, the pipe was working with it. It felt like I had just kind of stuck the stem on the end of it and um, it just didn't like the way this was flowing. Um, and then this one was kind of cool, but it was getting a little too uh, similar to some of the pipes I'd seen online and um, was not super original in the way that the pipe was shaped differently because uh, it just kind of felt like uh, I was cutting holes in a regular pipe stem and a bowl. So I wanted to kind of come up with something that had a bit more depth, a bit more story uh, that fit in with the scene. And so what I kind of decided to work towards was a 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea theme. Uh, so I started working on some concepts here. And this is what I've been working on the past couple of days or so. And uh, what I did first was I got in here and let me just start turning the layers off so you can kind of see how I built this up. Um, and I won't spend too much time talking about all of this before we get going, but I, I use the same process we talked about on Friday to gener generate some uh, grayscale and some shapes here. And then from this, I decided to go in with pencil uh, and, and Photoshop decided to uh, start painting those details up. So after I got that, I uh, got it to this point with these three concepts. And then I just went ahead and added a little bit of grayscale shading information uh, with an under layer to give us an idea of what this looks like. So I liked aspects of all of these concepts, but um, when I was talking to my buddy Craig, who uh, shout out to Craig, if you're watching this, uh, thank you for helping me out this afternoon. I was getting him to look at these concepts and just get him to throw ideas around with me about which one was better. And uh, out of all three of these, he said that, you know, this one felt really kind of futuristic. Um, they're all supposed to be sort of like submarines, but that was a little futuristic. This one was a little um, muddled in terms of the design language. Uh, and so maybe a little steampunkish, not, not old, just futuristic. Um, and so cool, but not really what we're going for. Um, but he liked the details on the interior side of this hole. And so this was the one he said had the best overall shape, silhouette, was most striking and felt, you know, old world and sort of like that. So this is the one I decided to start working on. And uh, the idea was to bring other elements from both of these. Like I like the little barnacles on the bottom of this uh, and these details over to this one. And so that's what I've kind of been working on the past couple of hours. And uh, so if we jump into tonight's painting, you can see I brought a copy of this one over. And then uh, one of the things I'm always focused on when I create models is not just to create something cool, but I want to create something that tells a story, right? And so uh, I decided to do a little paint over to uh, kind of demonstrate what direction I was headed with these and give myself an overall idea for what I needed to uh, do to get these finalized into pipes. And so two big things to consider here are where are we going to put the um, stem here. And so let me grab something to do notes with here. So the stem on both of these is uh, kind of an important part for how to join that to the rest of the pipe body. And then we have these holes um, where the top of the tobacco or whatever is put in and lit for the pipe. And so both of those are must haves on the pipe and we had to figure out a place to put those somewhere. So that's kind of what I've been brainstorming. Uh, one of the things I also wanted to include was uh, the sort of octopus monster thing from uh, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea book. So uh, we've got an octopus on both of these and then I, I want a little man on the hull kind of uh, trying to fight this, you know, sea monster or whatever. And so that to me, you know, tells a story, gives us something cool to look at. And I think it will fit in well as a sort of antique that sits on the desk in our 3D illustration. 
So tonight, before we jump into Blender and get started on some rough concepting, I wanted to kind of show you some of the detailing process for how I'm finishing these up. So after I got this rough sketch finished, I wanted to kind of start doing a, a final work over and paint these up in a little bit better uh, fashion. And so what I've been doing is uh, taking these uh, layers they already have, turning them down in terms of the opacity. So this one right here, I've uh, been taking this down to about 20%. And then on top of that, I've been sort of painting uh, the details on top. So we've got this stem in place. This one's kind of been started. And uh, as we can get closer to detailing these both up, the idea is to start picking a direction in terms of which one of these we want to use. And uh, I think I already know which one I'm leaning towards. Um, but before I kind of make a call, I want to give you guys a chance to give me feedback and let me know what you think in the chat. So um, as I kind of start getting in here and detailing up and sharing some tips with you guys for your concept art for 3D, um, let me know if you'd like me to cover anything or slow down or anything like that. And also let me know what you think about these concepts and which one you would pick to work on for your 3D model. Uh, all right, let's get in here and start painting up. So I've got a separate layer here for the overlay painting. Got everything layered up and separate. Uh, I'm using my own custom brushes here. And this whole thing has pretty much been done with this one uh, brush right here called the ballpoint pen. Um, and I've, I've been only really changing the smoothing factor on the pen here. So with a 15, it's pretty uh, smooth in terms of the way that I can quickly change direction and handle things. When I have these big, long, sweeping shapes, I like to turn this up to about 50, and that lets me slow down my uh, stroke, sort of like a lazy mouse effect. And uh, if you're familiar with sculpting in Blender, it's the same exact thing as a smooth stroke there. And uh, so that's one of the big things I've been using to keep things uh, sort of smooth and uh, not scraggly on my lines. Clean lines are, are super important with concept art, so uh, you want to make sure you know how to do that. Okay, so I'm going to move over to the bowl here and kind of sculpt or uh, sorry, sketch this out. Uh, and we need to decide with the under layer if we're happy with where that's sitting or if we want to change this up a little bit. Bear in mind, this is uh, from a side profile, so we don't want to give too much perspective to this because we want a pretty much an orthogonal view. So this is uh, the little hole in the top of the pipe where we're gonna insert the tobacco. And it's gonna sit on this sort of uh, spherical type shape here. And so what we're gonna get right here is sort of a cross section of half a sphere. And the rest of this area for the ship is gonna be carved out of the other half of the sphere. And that's a little hard to understand without being able to see multiple views. So I'll explain sort of more about the concept as we get into Blender. Um, but we just wanna lip there for indication that that's where the hole goes. And then we want a, a sort of solid mass that this is gonna be shaped out of. Because remember, um, we want a, a sort of version of this that looks like it sits into a pipe, right? Um, and so uh, I'm looking over at the chat and uh, Lauren just commented, it would be cool if the paddle wheel spun when the smoker sucks in the pipe. You know, it's funny you say that because uh, my buddy Craig said the exact same thing this afternoon and his thought was, um, but wouldn't you have to blow on the pipe to get it to spin? And uh, so we kind of abandoned that idea. Um, and uh, I think that is a cool idea. It would be interesting in terms of how we would uh, figure out a way to build that into a realistic looking pipe um, that felt like it could exist in, uh, in the sort of world that we've created. But uh, yeah, fun idea to kind of create that in that way. So maybe uh, at some point, if we uh, want to take an alternate version of this and rig it up or something, we can animate it and kind of do a little render or something at Eevee. Uh, all right, so 
pull these around. You can see what that smooth stroke is doing in terms of just enabling me to keep my line straight. And I've got my little Wacom tablet set up so that I can move around and uh, rotate as well. And rotating is really handy because um, before this was in Photoshop, it was really hard to um, find good angles for the way that you sketch. If you sketch on paper, you know that a lot of times you just you move the paper around, you rotate it and stuff like that. And digitally, a lot of times it can feel like you're kind of too locked into uh, the way that you're having to work. And so being able to rotate the page like that really frees you up to kind of make the workflow your own again. Um, so that is just a basic representation of how that's going to kind of look. And we'll do a better job when we sculpt, but now we want to kind of clean this up a little bit. So the main goal of me finishing this up right now is just to show you how to do detailing a little bit more at this stage, rather than um, spending all your time uh, doing what we did last time, which was just building up a basic idea. I wanna show you how to take it to that next level. So let's pull up the Pinterest here, and we're gonna take a look at some of the things that I pulled today for the Octopus reference. So this was a pretty cool um, poster that I found, uh, drawing. And the, the difficult part at this point is when you get into detailing, you need to know a lot about whatever you're drawing. And so the temptation is to get it, you know, up to a level and then think, well, okay, I'll just finish the rest of it. I'm 90% I'm of the way there. And the, the negative thing about that is that when you start making assumptions, your work suffers because you, you think about an octopus and somebody might think, well, it's not that complicated, right? It's basically just a ball and then there's eight tentacles coming off of it. Um, well, there's a lot more going on than that, as you can see here, a lot of overlapping shapes and the muscle and the structure of uh, the animal and everything like that underneath is important. And so if you want it to feel real, you need to pay attention to that sort of stuff. So this is just one version of that that kind of gives me an overall structure for, okay, this is gonna be sort of spherical. The eyes need to sort of bulge out of the top of the head here. The pupils are important. If we're gonna sculpt those, they need to look uh, with the same sort of, uh, you know, oblong shape. And then uh, the way this sort of all snakes out from the middle and, uh, how that looks is important as well. So that's one version. This is a, uh, I think this is a photo. And so this is a, a more realistic adaptation of what we would be trying to recreate here. And the one thing that I'm gonna kind of stylize a little bit is that I want this octopus to seem um, sort of like a monster. So we're gonna try to add some features maybe around the eyes that feel a little bit more menacing. And this is an awesome, artist rendition of uh, the very thing we're trying to sculpt right now and get into place, which is the uh, octopus attacking at 20,000 leagues under the sea. So this is the sort of thing we're trying to recreate uh, in our own way. And so that's kind of fun. There's another version of that. And so I think I want my guy to be sort of standing in the hole like this with his spear. And uh, we're gonna try to copy that same sort of thing. This one's more of a squid, I think. Um, just the way that's sort of shaped, but it's very interesting. I love this artwork. And then I've got some artwork here. You can see for the barnacles and also got some old school blueprints for the submarines and, uh, turbines and things like that to help me figure out how to get those details into place when I was doing these ships. Okay. So I'm going to pull this over to the other monitor, but I'm going to be using this to reference as I draw. And uh, again, we're not gonna spend the whole stream working on this. We're just gonna get in here and uh, you know maybe spend the first hour uh, kind of mocking this up. And then I'm going to do a quick sculpt concept um, and try to move quickly to get things blocked in. And this whole week we'll be working on this, uh, this model. So uh, tomorrow and Friday, we'll also be working on this if you are interested. And so tune in 7 p.m. on all of these evenings. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be having fun. So I'm gonna lower my brush size a little bit 
And this guy is going to be leaning sort of back. So rather than doing what he's doing here, I'm going to have his sort of posture be like he's leaning this way. And then we're going to have him stand and the spear is going to be sort of behind him a little bit. So let me pull up that reference a little bit so I can see what this guy's doing. His uh, arms are kind of stretched like this. And his back arm is pulled way back and holding the spear. So we've kind of got something like that going on. And then the, uh, the spear itself has sort of these little spikes on the end of it. And all of this right here is just to implicate a little bit of detail in terms of what we're trying to uh, put together in our 3D application. So we're not going to spend too much time making this look pretty. You know, we just want this to be a good roadmap for success. So that by that, that by itself right there is enough to help us understand what's going on there, you know? And he can just be completely covered, um, all black. If we wanna fill him in, uh, I'm gonna leave him like this, but doing a silhouette here would be probably a good idea. So there we go. And now we move on to the octopus. So I'm gonna scale the brush up a little bit. Pick some more reference to look at. Okay, we'll get a little bit looser. So we're gonna lower this down to about 20%. Feels good. Okay, so for the eye, I want something that's a little bit more angled down. Uh, angular shapes, when you wanna do something sort of menacing, makes more sense uh, than you know round happy shapes so we want to go for something kind of like this and kind of see how this is shaped from the other reference here so trying to see from a 45 degree angle view how this might look And at this point, if I was doing this for myself, I'd probably you know, slow down a little bit and take my time at this stage to really get the lines looking good. But um, because I want to move on, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time making this look really, really good tonight. So forgive, <laughs> forgive the, uh, the rapid pace here, but I'm sure you guys would rather see me working in Blender than in Photoshop, so. I just need to make sure I have a decent idea of what I'm trying to go for here. Um, so let's play a little bit with some of these shapes. Okay, not super fan of the way that's looking. So kind of up to us to stylize this the way we want to. And of course, this may end up looking very different when we sculpt it. Yeah, something a little bit more angry like that is probably good. And uh, I'm gonna do the same thing over here. Once we get these eyes nailed down, this will move a little faster. But 
sort of a sunken in area over here. So this eye will be sort of shaped like this. Let's see. So just thinking about the opposite of this, mirroring this over. And since this is on the outside edge, we got a chance to do something fun with the bumpy silhouette over there. So we don't want to waste that opportunity. So anybody that's watching, um, as I'm going through this, if you have any questions or want me to kind of talk about something, let me know and be happy to kind of discuss things. I am planning on doing a course coming up all about concept art. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure you subscribe. Uh, shouldn't the pupils be horizontal rather than vertical on the octopus? Yeah, they should be. Uh, the problem is if I go horizontal, it's going to feel a little less angry. So in the name of like making this feel a little bit more angry, I'm thinking vertical will be better because it seems a little docile if I turn these around. Um, and they're a little bit angled with the reference I'm looking at in this artist rendition. So not totally vertical, but a little bit more like a 45. And of course, this, uh, this also has the octopus sort of on its head here. Um, you know, they typically swim the other way. So, yes, in the name of uh, style here, maybe we need to decide what we want to do here. Yeah, I'm thinking it looks a little better with them sort of angled up. Uh, maybe we can split the difference and do something in between and see how that looks. So if we go here, maybe that's better. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of looks like a Chinese octopus here, but uh, oh well. All right, so other thing we want to make sure we do is kind of pay attention to the cranial structure here. I'm not even sure if that's the right term for it, being that I don't think they have a cranium, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. So the way you overlap lines here is going to be important as someone who's sketching because you want to try to give a little bit of a sense of depth here. And that's hard to do without shading. Uh, so whatever line is coming out in front will show you, uh, you know, a little bit of depth there. So some bumps are good too extreme and we're going to get a really, really wobbly kind of looking head. Uh, we don't want to do that. So just kind of pay attention to that. And just that little indication of that hash mark there lets us know that there's an eyelid sort of wrapping around over here. Okay, so that's going to come down. And then we're going to have the same sort of thing here. Okay, so we're going to try to get as close as we can. Fair warning, this probably won't be uh, anatomically accurate if you are familiar with this sort of thing, but just using the reference that I have in front of me to try to get this blocked out quickly. And we also want to sort of wrap this guy around the, the ship. So 
as we are thinking about creating these folds and things in the skin and, and all of that, we want to make sure that there's an underlying structure that he's on top of. All the tentacles and everything need to kind of fold and wrap around that sort of stuff. And so I've sort of planned this out a little bit, uh, not too much. But we've got sort of some webbing or something happening here. And then this octopus's tentacle is going to wrap around this. Uh, this is a little propeller, or not a propeller, a uh, it's a little fin or something that is uh, on the what would essentially be a submarine here. So there we go. And uh, this is all we need to do is kind of uh, map each of these out. And just think about the fact that this is sort of bulging out and he's not gonna follow every little fold and wrinkle of the ship, but enough to, uh, you know, the big form here, he's gonna go around the other side. So we're gonna pull this down. Sort of like that. Old chair for the muscle. Remember which direction this is going so we're not getting too crazy. And then once you've kind of got these all blocked in, you're going to have to go back and uh, sort of create some separation by filling in areas where the it's covering up the ship here. So this might be sort of the underside showing and there would be like suction cups and stuff sitting on this part. So uh, Lorian mentions perhaps taking one of the tentacles and having it come up and under the ship out the other side. So let's do that. want to thicken these up a little bit so we really feel like they're you know, menacing. Okay, so zooming back a little bit, let's take a look at uh, what we might do with the other tentacle. So we've got a couple up here that are gonna wrap up and around. This one's coming out the other side and sort of coming up behind this guy's head. Uh, so we've got, uh, what do we got left? One, two, three, four, five. We've got three left. So we got one coming down here already, which probably needs to sort of snake like this. So I like the idea of it going up the stem here. that stuff. Okay. So 
this one's sort of wrapping in on itself and tipping out right here. Maybe it looks like this needs to actually come out here. This is more up here somewhere. So that comes around like that. Maybe we have another one. Let's go ahead and draw these in. So this one's going to come around. this it's kind of wobbly um, and I wouldn't normally correct this but I want to show you guys how much easier it is to draw with this turned on so you have to sort of anticipate where it's going to go but you get way better lines this way um, Trying to look at where the ship ends here and then what kind of uh, angles we need to have. So let's it's that one. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six. So one of these, uh, what can we do? Let's do another one kind of down here. Just pokes out right here. Feels off. Okay. And then we'd have one sort of coming out this way. Don't really want to connect that all the way down. It feels wrong, and I think it's because this needs to sort of stay in front. Like that. Play with you know the anatomy and how that's supposed to wrap or whatever, but essentially. That's kind of what we're talking about. And so the only thing left to really do is join up these areas that need to have this sort of webbing there. And uh, that'll be it. So uh, that's probably enough of an indication to give us an idea of where we're headed. Um, so I'm going to turn off that so we can see our drawing here. And just from that, you can kind of see uh, what we get. And now we need to look for any big areas that have missing pieces we might want to correct on. And uh, there's not much going on that needs any correction. Um, 
and then of course I'd probably come back and you know add some more details to the ship when we have time barnacles and things like that but um, yeah so this is basically all we need to get started for uh, blender tonight in terms of concepting this out um, and so there's a lot of ways you can go about doing this the method we're going to use tonight is a little bit more freestyle and uh, by that token a little bit more dangerous in terms of your ability to kind of derail things and uh, mess it up so if you want to do this correctly you need to kind of plan things out and know what you're doing before you get past the beginning stages of the sculpt. And we are gonna sculpt this because it is supposed to be um, hand sculpted. And um, some of this we can start with models and then convert into sculpt. But uh, for the most part, some of this uh, is gonna need to be done by hand and we might start with a model for this part. So let's start with the basic game plan and talk a little bit about what we need to work on tonight. I'm going to get out my little note color here. Okay, so let me take a quick drink and then let's get into this. All right. So to get started, we can talk about big shapes, primitives that we can see that need to be here uh, in the model. Um, so starting off, we're gonna have a sort of spherical shape over here. And uh, so we'll have a sort of big circular object here that's gonna be split down the middle. So from the side, we would see uh, sort of uh, a round shape here that's very smooth for, for you to hold on to. And on the other side, we're going to have the, the ship sort of poking out of it. Like this. So this would be sort of a front view of the pipe um, and every everything hanging off of it and all that. Um, but that's kind of the idea I'm having right now. So we'll have a, a sphere here. We'll build this out as... Um, build this out as a model so I'm gonna model this uh, section right here because it's symmetrical and it will be easier to model than a sculpt so we need to just do that octopus will be sculpted last and that's because it is going to be a lot easier to sort of create an object, wrap this around the pipe to begin with, and then convert that into uh, a dynamic topology mesh and then sculpt once it's already on the pipe. And the pipe needs to be kind of done for us to do that. The man will probably be modeled, maybe a little bit of sculpting done there. And then uh, this will be easier to model but the rest of the ship is gonna be all sculpted. Uh, and all of this is uh, with the understanding that we're probably gonna start off with some basic primitive shapes um, to dial in all of the scale and everything. So that's the game plan. Uh, so let's jump over into Blender. We got 15 minutes early, all right. So I'm gonna save this. And then I'm gonna throw this over into the other screen. And let's jump into Blender. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up the 3D illustration because I don't wanna have to import this into another file. Jump to a layer that we're not using and then we can get rid of everything um, here for now. except for the 3D viewport. Okay. So uh, Lauren had a question, what's the difference between sculpting and modeling? Okay, so good question. Modeling is basically this. I start with an object called a mesh and it can be anything from a plane to a cone 
to a sphere. And then from that model or that mesh, I then modify it to create new things. Um, and modifying, tweaking, adding um, onto this existing mesh is what allows me to create complex objects. So that's modeling. Um, and so you can model anything and you don't have to sculpt, but sculpting is something that allows you to kind of more organically create shapes that are difficult to do. So creating a human from this object by itself can be done, but it's not fast or easy as uh, it might be when you're sculpting. So a good example is if I delete all of this stuff and I want to do a human head, even if I start with a cube, what I can do here if I jump into sculpt mode is let's say I add just one level of subdivision to this and apply that and then I jumped into sculpt mode and I want to do a face. There's not a lot of polygons here so we're going to need to use dynamic topology but let me kind of show you how much easier it is to turn this into something quickly with sculpting. So uh, we'll start with um, yeah, let's do relative detail, that's fine. So I'm gonna grab my pen here and let's go to town. So as I sculpt here, it's going to quickly start adding things. And before I do that, I'm going to turn on symmetry. So anything I do on one side is gonna be mirrored to the other and see what that's doing there. And then let's take the dynamic topology and make that even bigger, something like 15. So we're going to start really, really blocky. And we're going to kind of work on this as we go. And so as I mess with this, doing this by hand with subdivision surface modifiers is it's definitely doable, but it's not what I would consider easy. Right. And so now kind of got a chin down here. Maybe we've got cheekbones and the side of the head's going to be a little flatter, right? Let's move this out over here. Right now I'm just kind of adding geometry so that we have the same kinds of shapes all over the head here. And I'm smoothing that out. Now watch what happens when I start dialing down the details. So if we jump down to eight here, that's gonna lower the um, size of the polygons as I add them to the face. And so five would be even lower than this. And look how quickly like I can start blocking in facial features. So the eye sockets would be here, cheeks, chin would be down here mouth and we want to cut into this for where the no underside of the nose would be. I can quickly add and remove sections to kind of get this going. We want sort of like a some of the nose holes, nostrils area right here. looks kind of gross right now, but I guarantee you getting to this point with a model might take me half an hour, you know, um, maybe less depending on, you know, how, how I'm doing it or whatever. But, uh, and then, so watch this. I've got snake hook here, which is going to allow me to quickly grab sections and add geometry by extruding it. So if I make this really, really big and pull up, I can create a forehead and elongate what I've already got going here because I, I thought that was too small. So now let's jump back into uh, clay strips. And so it's pretty lumpy, so let's smooth this down. I'm using my tablet. So just a you know, $75, $50 Wacom tablet, you can get it Best Buy. Uh, if you're in the States and uh, 
pretty cheap, all things considered. Um, this is where the ear would go, and then you start hacking away uh, towards the back of the model. So I'm not going to sit here all night and sculpt a human, but you can see how quickly this would be to get in here and kind of mess with this. And it's just a game of uh, blocking in big details and getting everything up until uh, a good point until you're ready to move in, zoom in, and start doing smaller and smaller details as you go. So here we would want to carve into this for the neck. Let's move all that out. There you go, that's all it takes. And then eventually you're gonna get down to where you're really getting in here and sculpting in details. And so at this point, you are you need to be much further along um, you know, with a sculpt, but you can see how detailed you can get. And again, this is so fast compared to doing this the old school way. Uh, Cause I've modeled entire you know, humans using the, um, using the subsurf technique. And it's still something I would consider doing, but um, and not most of the time, because whether you're in Blender or ZBrush or whatever, um, I've probably done this in, what's it, what's it been? Less than 15 minutes I've got in here and, and I'm already this far with you know a human model. And uh, so that's what we're essentially trying to do tonight, but we're going to do it with the uh, the ship. So, and what's great too about this is um, you get the same sort of techniques with um, polygonal modeling in terms of the symmetry. So that's that's available. You've got the uh, tools like the grab tool here, which will allow you to move things around. I'm going to switch off dynamic topology but I can grab big sections and adjust the proportions of my face. Say this nose is too big, we can just move it in on one side. Skinny that up a little bit. Pull this chin out. There we go. Get back in here and keep going. Define the cheekbones. Yeah, I like doing people, um, especially using this method because it's super fast. There you go, just smooth it out, hold and shift as you sculpt and you can quickly get something done. Now I know that looks pretty ugly, but again, consider the alternative of, you know, having to get in there with polygons and modeling that. And uh, the great thing about this is once you're done, we can do what we did in the previous streams with a spoon and just retopologize it. And you can keep all the sculpted detail that's uh, already sitting there. Uh, so there you go. That is the difference between sculpting and modeling. So let's get in here and play with our model here. So I'm going to start with primitives to kind of block this into place. We'll create um, some objects here. So I could, but it's going to be too detailed um, to use the sculpt that I just did as a sailor. Um, and Something that's that small is going to take up probably way too many polygons and I would have to retop of it and all that stuff. It's going to be easier just to recreate something that doesn't have that much detail um, as we go. But yes, I could do that. Um, okay, so let's jump to a side view here. We're going to rotate this 90 degrees. So 
half of this we're going to leave kind of the way it is. The other half is going to be kind of sculpted into to create that um, sort of uh, the wheel shape for our propulsion system. And then we need to create a, another mesh for uh, the ship itself. So in this case, we can start with anything. Um, I'm going to start with a basic cube. And I'm just going to kind of eyeball some of these details here. None of the topology is going to matter because we're going to be sculpting with dynamic topology anyways. So don't worry about things getting too messy as we go. And uh, the goal here would be to move fairly quickly so we can get out of this stage and into the actual sculpting stage. But all I'm doing right now is giving myself uh, base meshes to work from the same way I just did with the human head uh, so that I've got an easier job trying to get all my shapes kind of whacked into place. Uh, so doing it this way gives me something to work on that's in the ballpark. And then I don't have to spend all my time in sculpt mode trying to move the model around to get it going in the right direction. Uh, I'm going to subdivide that down the middle. I'll probably start with uh, symmetry turned on because we're not really going to see but one side. And um, what I'm going to do is mirror this over right now. And as I pause, I'm looking at the reference to make sure I'm on track here. So in a more precise environment, I would probably create a model sheet if I was gonna model this, pull that over as a separate piece of reference in the viewport in the background, and then use that as a guide to line up all of the, um, the angles and the, the cut lines and all that kind of stuff on the model. But in this case, since we're going to sculpt it, um, as long as I have it up to look at, we're, we're in a good place. So that sort of tube shape is going to be the submarine. And um, all of the little sections that are on the side can be done as we sculpt. So we don't really need to worry about that. Um, the one part that I do want to be concerned about as we kind of get in here is um, making sure that we have a section here for the pipe to uh, stem to fit into. And so what I'm gonna do, I think is inset this right here. And trying to get a section of this that I can use as a, um, as a sort of circular shape. So let's think about how this would, how this would work. Trying to think if I actually need to create this part of it right now or if I can get away with it later. I can probably get away with it later. I'm gonna undo all that stuff, just get it to this point. And the only thing I really need is to have this section down here uh, sort of rounded out a little bit and lined up. Um, because if we look at the concept art, this, uh, sort of feels like it would be like, you know, tapering down towards the bottom, 
But as we get over to here, this section is obviously going to be round uh, for the stem and the way that that sort of screws into the pipe or, you know, pushes into the pipe right here. So we need to either reconfigure uh, as it gets towards the end here, it fattens back up, or, um, you know, we, we uh, need to have the whole rest of the ship here stay sort of in a round configuration. And I think what I'm going to do is just have it um, taper back out towards the end here. Now from the profile here, this needs to stay the way it is. And so whatever we do over on the other side needs to be changed just in this view. What's up MC25, good to see you. Yeah, I'm usually used to seeing you on uh, Twitch, so it's good to see you on YouTube. All right, so we don't want to move it here other than um, on the y-axis. So that means we can do this. So we can fatten that up a little bit there. I probably do need that cut right there to help this along. And we'll have to determine if this is actually a good idea or not. Okay, so pulling back in terms of real world scale, you can picture somebody holding this in their the palm of their hand. The ball would be, you know, the part where they're gonna put the tobacco into this section. Um, and then the stem is gonna sit into here. And so we need to see, is that too big? Does it feel right? Um, all that sort of stuff. I think we're getting there. Okay. So that's probably good enough. And we can already go ahead and model the uh, stem here and then pull that over into the, uh, the rest of this. And we may not even have to sculpt anything on this except for scratches, things like that. So I'll go ahead and uh, sub D model this real quickly. And we can start by taking a loop from this right here, shift back into the side view, shift D to copy that and put it pretty close to the edge here. And then I just extrude out with E. And that is gonna be the start of our, um, our stem. So as this kind of moves out, what I wanna do is um, maybe center the cursor here between these two vertices, which is gonna actually put it between uh, in the middle of everything of this sort of circular shape and try to use circle. Yeah, it doesn't really work with the mirror modifier enabled because of the clipping and it doesn't really understand that there's two sides to this. Um, and so what we could do though is space these out a little bit to where on the sides they're getting an even split and we just need to pull these vertices back to the middle here. So where this join back up with the clipping turned on so that's a little bit more evenly spaced there for us. We might even squeeze this on the vertical axis, scaling on the Z there. So that feels a little bit better. And now we can just uh, kind of extrude this along that curve and taper this as we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna get this ballpark. And then once we have the stem sort of in a good place here, kind of see what that's doing. We can add the little end pieces here. Um, and one of the ways we can do this is just, again, uh, duplicate this section, scale that out from the middle like that. Um, what we might do is 
sort of move this so it's not sitting on the same section so the vertices are not on top of each other. I'm gonna scale in slightly, extrude and scale out slightly, and then extrude over here, and then do the same thing, scale in. Kind of line this up a little bit better. So I'm not going to worry too much about intersections and all that kind of stuff right now, but just want to get this close to what it looks like in concept art. So this is a little further down, maybe closer to there. here. I'm just going to edge slide. The other section is pretty similar. So we'll start here. This is going to be sort of the, the mouthpiece area. So I want to go kind of perpendicular to this angle here to make sure that's in a good position before I extrude. And then we'll get this a little closer to that profile, extrude this way. And then we will extrude in and then go back into the pipe like this. So this right here, we can bevel. Flip the normals. And I think that's good. Okay, so now based on the thickness of that stem, we can really start to get in here and look at, well, okay, so if that's how thick the stem is, then realistically speaking, this, uh, this section for the submarine or the ship or whatever needs to be a lot thicker, right? I'm going to also delete the faces on the inside because those are going to be a problem when we start sculpting. Hello to everyone that has just uh, jumped into the stream. Glad you're here. We are working on a concept for a um, hand carved pipe tonight. Okay, so one of the other things we can kind of do here is pull the rest of these vertices into the sphere a little further. That way when we join this all up, these are going to kind of blend. Otherwise, that's, uh, that's going to be an issue. All of this stuff can come down a little bit. And 
And then it looks like um, we need a little section here that is sort of cut out. So I'm going to take this face here, get rid of that. We'll extrude this edge back over here and create a face. Now we got kind of a little notch there as indicated on the hole in our concept art. And I'm trying to decide right now what other features we need to add into the base mesh before we start sculpting, um, if anything. Definitely want to make sure all of these sections are penetrating through that sphere. I think the rest of the pieces can probably be added as we go. So uh, the other thing to think about right now, before we jump in here and start going crazy, is uh, the actual mechanism for moving this wheel around and how we might want to think about that as we start designing here. So I'm going to turn the notes off here, zoom in a little bit, and let's kind of look at how this would um, kind of work. So I haven't thought about this a lot as I was drawing this up. Um, I knew this would sort of be spinning around this sort of turbine thing. And the idea would be that it moves um, counterclockwise if, as we're looking at this and scoops the water and pushes you, you know, along sort of towards the left here. Um, the issue with that is from this view, um, we can't really tell how that's looking um, as these move through the other side of the ship. So is it is it all the way on the other side of the ship? Is it is there a big gap in the middle where these, you know, scoops are moving through, um, and it's sort of on a um, a little uh, shaft there that keeps it in the middle, or or how is this working? Um, and so we need to kind of think through this before we start sculpting. So if we were to kind of look at this. Currently, we have sort of a top view of our ship. And with this, uh, currently the way it's laid out, this section will be kind of cut away. And we're gonna start seeing this uh, scoops and things like that right here from the top view on the side. Um, so there would need to be a section here cut out to allow the room, allow this uh, to have room for these to move through. So we need to actually be something like this. Okay, so uh, Lori had made a comment that the paddle wheel will not work because the window is here, and that is very true. So uh, if we try to do it this way, the window is gonna be somewhere right about there, and that will not work. So uh, solving problems, we need to move this paddle wheel over to the opposite side of the ship over here. So this section is actually going to be cutting into the sort of spherical shape over there. And then maybe this half of the ship is sort of redesigned to accommodate that change in structure. So if this sort of paddle wheel has this turbine right here, and then these sections are built like this on the side, and then the window is... Say right here. Then uh, from the other side, this is kind of how it would look. So um, we need to look into this and see if we're happy with the way this is planned out. Now we also have the hole right now 
uh, kind of mapped out up here on the other side of the sphere. So if the hole is actually needing to be like this big, is that practical? And it's probably not. So what we might need to do is put the hole right here. So this could work out like this for the tobacco. Um, so one of the things I'm kind of thinking too is it might be more interesting if we were to take a look at the sphere and map it out to where it had a section of it cut out like this. And this is where we saw the, uh, the turbines and things, but it stopped like halfway. And that would give us something that's a little bit more complete to work on for holding the pipe and, and things like that. Um, but that would, that would kind of do it in terms of just doing a little cutaway that you would see like in a cross section where we only see about this much. And the rest of this is part of that sphere. I think that will look better because we're gonna end up with a shape from the top that's more like this. And uh, yeah, I think that's gonna be a little better for us. So let's go with that solution for right now and uh, kind of take a look at this. So we can actually start by trimming the sphere down. And let's cut away one quarter of this. And this part we actually will just go ahead and model because it's gonna be a lot faster. So there we go. And how much time we got? 40 minutes. Okay. So for this part of it, we need to decide how we're gonna resolve these open vertices now. Move this back over to the other side. Okay. So these sections for the wheel, we're going to cover that part of it up. Um, but if those aren't gonna be part of the sculpts, then this is still gonna be an issue for us. So what we might need to do is actually go ahead and create one section that actually has a face there, just so that we have this all connected. And you will see um, a bit more about why that's important when we actually merge the whole, all the meshes together, but um, yeah. So one of the things I'm gonna do, since we're not really gonna work on this pipe section here, is I'm going to separate this whole thing um, since we're not gonna sculpt this. So that will be its own sort of little object there. And then these two, uh, we can go ahead and just Boolean these together with Control plus on the numpad, and that will add a union Boolean for us there. Okay, so we're gonna have an issue because um, we haven't applied this, uh, this modifier yet. So what I'm gonna do is uh, go ahead and uh, kind of make this into a live mesh with Alt-C. And first thing I'm gonna do is duplicate everything, move it to a new layer. So we have a backup, Alt-C mesh. Now we can create a Boolean. Okay, so we'll grab both of those, Control plus, apply that. And we should have a mesh here that is combined without issue. So let's take a look at that. 
And there we go. So that's one way of doing it is using the Boolean modifier. Um, it's not a super elegant solution, but it is doable. The other solution is to use the remesh modifier uh, or the remesh add-on that is part of the sculpt tools. So we jump down to the sculpt tools command. Um, we just need to select these two, click remesh, and that will um, remesh this according, or actually not remesh. Um, I'm gonna do that. Uh, union here, which will join them together. And uh, in this case, it's gonna do sort of the same thing, but um, it, uh, it actually works also when you have sort of a, a really dense mesh for sculpting, which is why it's, it's here as well. So one of the things I might do before we do that is uh, to go back to this and take it off of wireframe. Uh, let's go ahead and add another subdivision here. I'm gonna grab all of these edges here that we already know we want to kind of crease up and I'm gonna bevel these. So we're gonna get a really tight edge there for that cutout. Apply that and then use that same combination. It's gonna give us more points to work with as we start sculpting and uh, give us good footing to start off with on this side. So as you can imagine, holding this, if you were gonna hold it in your left hand, would be a lot better uh, and, and easier to hold than the uh, spiky solution of having this exposed like all the way around. Um, and I still think it'll look pretty cool, so. Uh, Lorian said, why not put a paddle wheel on each side of the bowl? That's another solution, which would also work. Um, the problem with that is going to be to get those popping out on the sides of the bowl. We would have to have the ship be ultra wide. So if we were to uh, take our little thing here, having this um, come out with the, the, uh, the wheel here and then the wheel here, would mean that the uh, this would have to kind of go around the sphere itself, uh, the way it's currently set up. And then if we cut the sphere away, the solution would just kind of make it look a little different. So that's doable. So we we'll probably have like a turbine sort of thing here on both sides. And then the scoops would be here. And that's kind of how it would look, which might be kind of cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Could do it this way. This would not change. This would be in the same place as far as our hole for the tobacco goes. Um, so yeah, we might do that. It's, uh, it's an option. We think about that. And, uh, we will go ahead and create the, um, the wheel itself. So we can kind of just decide what to do with it after that and see what is going to work better. Okay. Uh, the upside to having this kind of the way it is right now is that for the most part, it's symmetrical. So when we wanna start sculpting, we can turn on the, um, let's go to Sculpt Tools, jump down to the tiling or symmetry, and we can lock on the, um, I guess in this case it would be the x-axis. No. Y axis. There we go. Okay. We do that. Now when we get over to here, if we want to sculpt at all on this end of it, we're going to need to um, turn off that or keep these separate. And I think to start off, 
it might make more sense to just keep these separate for now. And then later on, we can combine them if we need to. The great thing about that is that we can go ahead and smooth this out to kind of be what we need it to be here and uh, work on that part of it. And then later on, we'll merge that up. But for now, that means we can just completely use symmetry on this as we go. Okay, so let's get in here and start working on some stuff. And before we jump into the paddle wheel, um, I'm thinking about just going ahead and starting sculpting. Do you guys want to see me model the paddle wheel first, or do you want me to work on the? Uh, do you want me to work on the the submarine here? Okay, I'm gonna start working on the sub. So I'm gonna keep this flat shaded for now. Jump into sculpts. All right, sub first it is. Uh, let's keep clay strips up. Let's put our Photoshop reference on the other screen. Okay, so I'm gonna turn everything off except for the submarine. So that's the only thing I'm looking at right now. And the first thing I wanna do is start off very, very zoomed out. And uh, we're only gonna focus on kind of getting the um, silhouette into place first. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to grab. Uh, Joseph Jackson says, I was thinking perhaps the paddles could in some way go in and out of the wheel, sink into the wheel on approach of the hull, and then come out when clear. It's interesting. Um, so maybe they're kind of crooked in at a 45 degree angle like that. Um, not sure mechanically how we can make that work, but it is an idea. So we can think about that when we get to the paddle part. Okay, um, we're not gonna turn on dyna dynamic topology right now because we just want to kind of get the silhouette in place. And so we're just gonna grab this and kind of start moving it around. Okay, so that's not on the proper um, symmetry. There we go. Okay, so decide whether or not we want to taper this in further or not. And add a little bit more geometry. So we'll grab clay strips. I'm going to turn the strength down to something pretty low, like 0.1. And then we'll turn this on and use a scale of about, let's start off with 10 here and see what that's doing. Okay, so you can see how uh, stretched everything's looking right now. Could be a couple of reasons for that, but what I'm gonna do before we get too far along is jump into object mode and let's check our scale here. So you can see how the scale, uh, I, I messed with this in object mode as we were getting things into place. We need to apply this before we start messing with sculpting too much. And that kind of goes for all of these objects. We need to apply scale here. So that's one thing that could be going on. Let's see how that changes what's happening as we start adding those polygons. They're not stretched out anymore. Uh, Lorian says, does the submarine have a window on each side or just on the port side? I'm not sure. Uh, in this case, it might be interesting to um, get a little creative with both sides. So one side could be like super detailed in terms of the way it looks in the concept art, and the other side could be just completely smooth. So we could have a sphere here and then just 
one continuous like abstract object connected all the way up to the stem. And it would be kind of cool to see the cutaway on this side with the ship kind of emerging from that shape, if that makes sense. Um, and that's assuming we don't end up adding any more of, uh, you know, going with anybody else's ideas, because we might do that. All right, so we can really quickly add in a little bit more geometry all over this, this pipe here. And this is just so that when we start grabbing and moving things around, there's a little bit more to work with. Um, so let's grab. Make sure we turn back off that dynamic topology. Okay. Might sort of taper this side in a little bit here. It's looking a little bit more interesting like that. Now let's go in and start playing. Take this down to a seven, maybe a six. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing. Just kind of add in a little bit of geometry here. And if we hold shift, we can smooth that out now. My smooth is turned way up right now. So I'm gonna switch over and turn that down to about a point two five. So now if we smooth, it's not really gonna affect the silhouette nearly as much. So this part's pretty quick to do. Okay, so now we can turn our strength back up on clay strips. Let's change this back to maybe a point four. I've got my um, pen pressure set on might turn this on for the radius as well. And let's just kind of see what our strokes are doing right now. So kind of see what's happening there. Turn this up a tiny bit. Bring that down to five. And now let's kind of start playing with our shapes here. So I'm gonna switch into full view. And then I'm going to, before I do that, split my window. Uh, so I'm going to keep this one on top view so we can kind of see what's happening. And this one I'm going to use as I sculpt. So the first thing I want to do is kind of make sure that I'm maintaining this little dip here in uh, this top angle. So I'm going to add back sort of a layer here. Might Peel this away. You kind of see what that's doing here. And Grab a crease brush, pull that through a little bit. Okay. Let's, uh, let's check on our concept art and see what section we want to work on first here. So, uh, some of the things that we might want to get into place first are some of these bigger hole sections that have these rounded corners. Uh, those shouldn't be too hard to block in. And really it's just about 
adding some clay on these forms um, and the areas or digging in to kind of scrape them away and then rounding out the edges. Um, and uh, we can use crease and clay strips and that's pretty much all we're gonna need to get most of this into place, I'm guessing. So I'm going to kind of dig in here on the side and I'm just looking at that reference as we go. So tiny bit of a dip here on this side. We can use our flatten to kind of get that down. And that scoops up over here. So it kind of joins back up. Okay. One thing I'm going to do is turn off my grid. Okay, so it's probably a little strong. I'm gonna pull that down a little bit. Hold control and we'll dig into this side a little bit and then re flatten this section here. So I think it is kind of like we're carving out the side of a hill uh, or plowing some snow away. And it's important to maintain pretty long, even strokes at this point, because if we start getting in here and doing this, we're gonna start seeing a lot of uneven surfaces. We're gonna have to go back and kind of fix. Um, so the, the key here is those long, uh, smooth strokes. And if you need help with that, again, you can just check off smooth stroke, uh, which is the same as in Photoshop, and then play with these settings here to kind of dial that in a little bit more. Uh, if we're we're getting this happening a little bit towards the end here. We can just add to add some clay here to kind of increase how this is joining back up to that stem there. And then hold shift and taper this back off. Lower the size there and make that a little smaller. Just beefing this up a little bit. One of the other things we can do for this sort of issue is use the uh, inflate command, our tool, which will help just universally kind of increase the, uh, the size of a mesh. So right here, we can just really kind of beef that up a little bit. Okay. All right, so out of this section over here, we have the opposite sort of thing happening where it's coming up and over. So we can add this here. And that's coming up and creating sort of a lip right here. And the rest of this is sort of dug in and we've got some more sectional things happening over here. So to the point where this all back in here needs to kind of be brought down and in. So we might use a layer for this. And we can change the way this is sort of working, uh, whether you want to sort of specify just uh, an axis or anything like that. So you can see what that's doing based on the height setting that we have here. We're going to subtract in, and this is always pretty high up there, so we're going to need to lower this down quite a bit. 
And I think this has to do with real world uh, blender units. I'm not positive on that, but that because I tend to work a little smaller in the viewport, that could be why this value is always going to be so small. Um, but yeah, so if you don't check off accumulate, this won't add up. So if you just do this all in one stroke, you can uh, kind of keep this all sectioned off in one piece. And that's kind of a, a handy way to get some layering happening. Um, quickly so you can see what that's doing might decide we need the same thing here a little further in so we can do the same thing decide to layer this off and I think we're gonna need to go quite a bit more So I'm trying to stay as neat as I can. And if I pull, I'm actually gonna go ahead and turn on my other screen so you guys can see the, the reference that I'm looking at. Um, it's this section, the lower left-hand corner of the screen, if you're looking at my other screen, you can see what I'm talking about. But this section right here is the one I'm working on where it sort of digs in, comes back up, and this entire section is sort of cut in to the rest of the, the model there. So I'm gonna get the front part of this right, and then we can come back and kind of focus on how this needs to merge up but I don't have any more to move around over here with. So we need to, we need to get this locked down first before we worry about this side. Okay, so we're just working on the layering a little bit. Might go ahead and add some instead of subtracting at this point. Smooth this out. Okay. So section down here needs to be quite a bit further out. And then as we get closer to this underside down here, we're gonna taper in a little more. Now, I want this to kind of come to a point. So since we've got the both sides being mirrored, we can start kind of in the middle here and add this up. And then I'm just making big, long, smooth strokes and we're gonna layer this up more in the middle than we do on the sides. And it won't take much to kind of get us going in the right direction. And uh, once we kind of smooth this all back down, play with the this up. In this case, we're going to use pinch. Start here and drag this down the middle. And I like to use the uh, smooth stroke for pinch because it tends to be a little difficult to get uh, straight lines with this tool. So if we start here and just pull that down the middle, we should get a nice little peak there. And uh, yeah, we'll just have to play and kind of build this up as we go. That's what we're after. 
Okay. Let's take a look at this a little bit. I like the way this is sort of just um, coming into the sphere here. It feels a lot like what it, I think it would feel like if you started with a solid hunk of something and then you had to kind of work on it. Okay. I like to check the profile every now and then, make sure it's not getting too sort of lumpy. And if it is, we can do a little bit of clay addition on the sides until we kind of get it even back out. And if you pay attention as you go and do this, it's gonna be a little easier to maintain the shape that you need versus waiting till all the details are kind of in place and then going back and going, oh man, like everything's wobbly. Well, if you watched me uh, work on the spoon last week or last couple of weeks, um, I got pretty far along with the spoon uh, for the 3D illustration and had to go back and kind of work on some stuff because it was, uh, Wobbly. Okay, so we got a section here that's also kind of raised out to about here. Now what I can also do is uh, switch over to the masked command and draw in a section that I want to raise up. So in this case, telling Blender what areas to focus on for sculpting. And then I can hold control to remove sections from the mask. Once we've kind of got it in place, jump back to our layer command. I'm gonna invert the mask with control I now it's only going to work on areas that are masked. So that's one area right there. And then we've got another little dip. Let's see right here. So we can go back to mask and we're just gonna take away the outer edge a little bit here. So I'm gonna hold control. Actually, I'm gonna undo that. I'm just going to paint around this outside edge. Try to be as straight as I can. And I wanna come in far enough that I've completely cleared the other lip that we just made. And now I should be able to get two layers pretty quickly. So Alt-M will clear the mask and there you can see we've got two layers. So the uh, detail that I'm currently working with as far as the dynamic topology goes is based on relative detail, which means it's going to change depending on how far I zoom in. So if we want to ensure a consistent uh, results, we need to kind of pick a zoom distance and stick to it so that we're not, um, we're not gonna be changing the number of polygons that are added every time we, um, we get in here and start sculpting. Now, if you want to change that, you can use a setting besides relative detail, and that will keep that from happening. So um, switch this to brush detail, and then you're going to pick a percentage um, to, to use for adding new details to the geometry. You can also use constant detail, which will let you pick a resolution that you type in. Um, and so this just changes as you uh, need to work on different sorts of sections. So it's all dependent on what you want to work on. And I like either constant or relative. Uh, I don't use brush that much. 
But this one's kind of cool because with resolution, you can use a little eyedropper and pick an area that you've already sculpted and it will then insert the number that is based on the same number of uh, polygons for the density in that area. And so if you need to go back to an area and you don't know what setting to use here, just use the eyedropper tool and it will start uh, picking a number for you. Uh, or you can type one in manually. So in my case, I want something closer to about here. So 80. And now, no matter how far I zoom in, it's going to keep everything consistent for me. So I can choose to kind of dig in here on the sides. Probably a better tool to use here for this would be crease. And remember that crease will um, crease will dig in and pinch will uh, sort of go the opposite direction. So if you want to have a ditch or something like that, you use crease and pinch is for kind of going uh, along like this down here. So let's go back to shift. I'm going to turn this down even lower because I don't want to lose this lip. I just want to smooth out those polygons a little bit. So we're getting close to the end here, guys. I will be back tomorrow night. I'm gonna keep sculpting for a few more minutes, um, but I will be back tomorrow night to continue this concept. And I'm here every week, Wednesdays through Fridays at 7 p.m. So, Definitely subscribe to the channel. And uh, check out the other streams. There's a lot that's been happening the past few weeks. Uh, okay. So... Let's take this down about 0.4. Okay, so this is getting a little uh, a little messy on the top. And so rather than trying to use clay strips to even this all out with smooth, uh, I'm gonna switch over to flatten. And flatten, even though it looks like this and does indeed do that if you stay in one place, can be used to kind of round things off. So um, what I'm gonna do here is make my brush kind of big. And then once I have an area kind of flattened, I'm gonna rotate a little bit. I'm gonna flatten here. And one thing I forgot to do is turn on a matte cap, which will make this a lot easier to sculpt. 
so Lorian asked, once I get done with this, would I consider doing a live stream beginner project? Yes, of course. Uh, what would you like me to kind of work on? And I will be happy to do a live stream just for that. <laughs> something simple. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit more about where you're at right now. Uh, what, what kinds of stuff are you interested in learning and um, what kind of project can I help you with? Because uh, the more specific you can be for me, the, uh, the better I can help kind of figure out what you would like me to work on. So um, happy to do a project for you, but uh, yeah, think about it, and if you don't, if you can't tell me tonight, that's a, that's fine. Uh, tell me some other time this week as you kind of tune in, and um, I'll make notes and everything. And I uh, want these streams to be really valuable to you guys. And uh, if there's anything I can do to kind of make them better, definitely let me know. And um, you know, I'm, I'm only doing this because I want to kind of show you guys that you know these projects are not impossible anything that you want to do can be done and uh, i'd love to help you in any way that i can and uh, obviously we want you guys to be a part of the guild as well so um, it's uh free to join if you want to be a free tier member that's fine um, and then eventually i'd love to have you guys inside as um, full members of the guild but uh until then, there's going to be plenty of free content coming up to take advantage of, so. So uh, was was the course you're beginning uh, Blender Unleashed, the Mastering 3D Fundamentals quickly? Is that the one that you're kind of working on right now? Um, okay, so what I might do is jump in one evening and uh, just do an entire rundown of some of the stuff that's in that course as far as uh, basic keyboard shortcuts and commands and add-ons and stuff like that. So uh, let me plan that out a little bit and maybe starting next week uh, on Wednesday or something, I can... Um, plan out a specific live stream for uh, beginners. And so I think that would be good. If anybody else uh, is just starting out and you would also be interested in a course like that, let me know in the comments and that way I'll kind of know how much interest there is. And if you do need more help with that sort of stuff, I do have an entire uh, eight hours or so course on that inside the guild. Um, and it's, it's a great introduction to all of the, uh, things like the modifier stack and we don't hit on sculpting in that course, but we do talk about modeling and lighting and rendering and, um, all sorts of stuff like that. So, uh, Lauren, out of the question, can 
can Blender do everything that say ZBrush can do? Do you recommend using ZBrush, Maya, Blender, et cetera, for different projects? Um, short answer is I recommend using whatever tool you need to use to get the project done that you have available to you. Um, so if you have the means to go get ZBrush, you have the means to get Maya, um, and there's a reason for you to use it for a project, then by all means use it. Um, I, I graduated with a degree in digital media and animation using Maya. And I my first job out of college was at a studio where we used Maya exclusively. And uh, you know I snuck Blender in there on a lot of projects. Uh, and they let me get away with that. But uh, yeah, I, I had to use Maya coming up. And uh, you know I, I preferred Blender just because I, I loved it for so long and used it in my own projects. Um, but I know Maya and it's very useful. There's a lot of things it can do that are uh, things that Blender can't just in terms of it being further along because it's been around for longer and because it's uh, industry standard or considered industry standard. And so a lot of studios, uh, including the big guys out there like ILM and um, a lot of other studios that are gonna do all the VFX for motion pictures and uh, of course, the game studios are going to use 3ds Max, which is sort of the counterpart to Maya for game development uh, for the most part, along with ZBrush and Substance and things like that. And I use ZBrush and Substance and things whenever um, I feel like I need to for a project. There's There are things that Blender can't do. Um, and so some of those things are changing. There's a lot of features being added with especially the 2.8 release that's coming out later this year. Uh, that will make Blender better than it ever has been. Um, I prefer to use Blender. I prefer to stick with Blender for most of my projects just because, um, well, I teach it, so you know I need to stay up to date with the software and use it as much as I can. Um, but I, I like the interface. I like the way it works. I'm very comfortable with it, and I think um, it's such a powerful tool that has everything kind of all in one package. Now. Uh, sculpting, ZBrush, great example. Blender is not nearly as fast and can't handle nearly as many polygons in a scene. Uh, you know, I, I top my, my polygon count out on a sculpts, maybe six to 12 million tops, and that's on a good day. That's if I have nothing else open and I'm not trying to stream and, you know, it's, uh, it's hard on the system and I have a decent system. Um, ZBrush, on the other hand, on the same system, I can boot it up and have hundreds of millions of polygons uh, in a scene, and it's just written to work with that sort of setup. So it, it's better at that. And it's just the way that it handles memory, and um, it's, it's using your RAM to store all of the available uh, polygon usage, which isn't exactly how Blender works. Um, and so it's just, it's more efficient, that sort of thing. Substance is another example. I, I love cycles. I love trying to build everything procedurally in cycles and Blender. Substance designer is just better at it. Photoshop is easier to paint with. I love B Painter. I love trying to paint in Blender, but like, I grew up on Photoshop. You know, it's just faster to build brushes. It's easier to use with a tablet um, and all that sort of stuff. And Substance Designer, Substance Painter, that just has more features. And the only reason for that is because everyone in the industry for whatever reason has decided this is what we're gonna use. And so a lot more people are talking about it. A lot more people are uh, asking questions and getting their questions answered. And of course the development teams have money to throw at all these problems, um, private money that is very abundant. And so they get what they need, you know, when they need it. Um, and, and so there you go. That's, that's what my suggestion is. So if all you have to use is Blender, um, don't worry about it. I, uh, I don't have a co copy of ZBrush right now. I don't have a copy of Maya. Um, I have Substance and Photoshop and Adobe Suite and stuff like that because uh, I feel like they're essential. But uh, the other stuff, when I need to use it, I get a copy. Um, I license it when I need it and I use it for a project. And I'm usually getting paid and it's worth it. But when I don't need it for that, uh, or if I can't afford it or whatever to keep up with the licenses and all that sort of stuff, I let it go. And it sucks sometimes if you need it for something and you don't have it, but if you're smart in the way that you work, 
Blender can do what you need it to do. And uh, the trick is just to be efficient with your workflow. Pay attention to how you're putting things together and planning as you go. And that's why it's so important to do what we did tonight. And before we get in here and get crazy with poly counts, with sculpting, we, we went on a paper, we went into Photoshop, we made a plan, we made a game plan, and we decided how to solve problems before we got in over our heads, you know? And uh, yeah, so that's the big difference, is if you're smart and you work that way, you're not really gonna have any problems. Um, Lauren says, do you recommend that we also learn the other programs? And do you think that Blender will eventually be able to do everything the other ones can do? So I highly recommend learning the other programs if you have the means and if you feel like you need it for your workflow, or your, especially for your career. Uh, I highly recommend keeping up to date and learning things like Substance. Most Blender artists that I know that texture, they do game work especially, they have to learn Substance because it's the only program out there that can kind of do what Substance designer and, and painter can do. Um, it's the same way for the other programs. Now, can Blender do pretty much 75% of what Maya can do until we get into things like certain render engines, certain physics simulations, things like that, hair particles, all that kind of stuff? Yes, Blender can do most of that for whatever you would need it to do, especially on an indie level, right? But the reason Maya and Max and all that software exists and thrives and gets built upon and is used for all the other projects in the industry is because at some point someone had to solve a problem and then someone on a team for a movie decided hey we're going to write some piece of code for this software that does this feature and then we're going to solve a problem for this movie because we have to figure out a way to do it. We can't do it with the software we have. Eventually, those solutions get built into that software. Now, the same sort of thing kind of happens with Blender, but Blender kind of gets, you know, it adapts what's already out there in terms of white papers and things in the industry. And so we don't have full-time developers that are, you know, I want to be careful what I say here. Blender Institute has an amazing set of developers and they're working around the clock to try to make things better and improving things, but it's, it's a nonprofit organization, right? It's, it's, uh, they have limitations and they're also not about making money. They're not about commercial enterprises, right? Um, so the goals are just different. And because of that, and because there's not a lot of money involved, um, the solutions just come slower sometimes. And so we have to wait a little longer to get those results. And, uh, but yeah, I do recommend learning the other stuff if you if you need to do that. And um, I do think eventually Blender will catch up uh, to a degree that we're, we're going to be able to not have to jump into as many pieces of software. Will it ever replace everything? No, because uh, the second that we think Blender's caught up to a certain level, um, the other software also goes and excels to an even further degree. And, you know it sets it raises the bar even higher so no we're never going to catch up completely um but that's okay because again most of us aren't working on blockbuster films uh we can get away with what we need to get away with right now to create good art so and uh can you get good skin textures with blender and uh yeah you can get fantastic skin textures with blender and like i said it'll all depend on the project and the application so if you're going to do something and you're working on the next Lord of the Rings or you're uh, working on Game of Thrones or something where you need to have uh, 32K, 64K texture for skin because it's gonna be in 4K, 8K resolution on film and it's gonna be up close. Uh, no, it can't do that. But how many projects are you working on that need to have that resolution? You know, I know professionals who have never touched anything beyond 4K in their entire lives and may not. Um, and, and most people in the game industry, you know, they're not going to work in the same resolution that the film industry does because the film industry has to have high resolution for film. Um, and so they're not going to use the same software, you know. Uh, Mari is a great texturing program. It's probably the best um, texturing program out there as far as high resolution goes. But most everybody that I know can use and get away with using Substance for their projects. They don't need to use Mari because Mari is only really needed to be brought out when 
you're working on transformers and you need to have, you know, 3,600 textures for one robot. Most people don't need that. Uh, so I think it's, it's tough cause you get into this thing where you feel like, and let me just go ahead and, uh, kind of switch back to my webcam at this point. You get to a point where you feel like there's so much coming out. There's so much I have to learn. There's so much that, that, that I have to keep up with. And the truth of the matter is we hold ourselves to this higher standard we hold ourselves to this ideal that we have to be perfect and we have to be on the cutting edge and we have to do all these things. And the truth is like, no, what we have to do is we have to create good art. You know, we have to give ourselves permission and find a workflow and find a way to just sit down and do something creative and, and find a way to put ourselves into the work and, and make something fantastic. And it doesn't, whatever software you have in front of you that allows you to do that comfortably, and I, I think that's a very important part of it, is that you need to feel comfortable with whatever workflow and software that you're using. And so if you feel better using ZBrush than Blender for sculpting, then use ZBrush because you're gonna be more productive. And if you can't afford ZBrush, that's fine. Like use Blender and eventually once you use it enough, you may not want to use ZBrush because you're so used to the workflow that you don't need to use it. And uh, you may find out that if you're all you're working on are game characters um, that are for real-time application, Blender's fine. You don't need ZBrush because you're never going to use anything that has that many millions of polys in one scene. Now, do I know that for sure? No, I don't know that for sure. And everybody's situation is different. I'm just telling you from my experience the times that I've spent money and I felt like I needed something and I pulled the trigger so many times I've done that. And then I realized I didn't even utilize whatever I bought or I, I came back around eventually and I used it or something, but I have assets that I've bought and I haven't used. I have software and rendering solutions, engines and things like that, that I've bought used a couple of times. And then it's a lot of money to just, throughout there. So if you're going to go that route and you're going to get commercial software, um, month to month, you know, renting and, and memberships and things like that. Substance is like 25 bucks a month, uh, 20 bucks a month, maybe like that, um, to, to have that software and you get all the software they have to offer. It's three or four applications. Uh, unfortunately ZBrush doesn't have a rent to own right now. Uh, or if they do, it's pretty expensive. Um, Maya is, is expensive. It's about 125 a month or something like that if you want to own Maya. And uh, the yearly solutions are, you know, uh, not cheap. So again, if you're going to start off with something commercial, I would, uh, I would decide how much 3D and how much 2D you're going to do and, and decide whether or not you need Adobe. Um, because if all you're going to do is something that you would be able to do in Photoshop, you can probably use GIMP or something else that's free like Krita uh, that's open source. Me, I edit and I use After Effects and I use Photoshop and I use Illustrator and I use all of it. So I don't really have an option. So that's 50 a month for the Adobe suite, 25 a month if you need substance. And I don't always need substance. Um, I need it more now than I have in the past. But uh, so that's an option and that's about it. Like you don't really need a whole lot else besides Blender to get into this work. Um, so uh, got some more questions here. Do you ever use PS3D or Adobe Dimension or Adobe Fuse? Uh, no, I haven't really played around with the 3D features in Photoshop all that much um, other than just experimentation. I With Blender, there's really no need to go back to a dumbed down version of 3D. Um, so I don't really use Adobe for that. And I also, um, we have a better rendering engine, so there's really no need to, to go back to that unless I, I find a reason. And uh, don't use Adobe Fuse or anything like that. Uh, it doesn't mean I wouldn't be willing to do a course at some point down the road on that sort of stuff if everybody decided that they needed it. Um, but where we're headed in the future is gonna be more, um, 
related to things that we all enjoy working on. And so that's going to depend on feedback. And honestly, from you guys, what I need to know now um, in the comments and uh, in these live chats, in the comments on Facebook, in the comments on YouTube, um, and all that sort of stuff as I come out with tutorials and I do live streams and all that kind of stuff, I need to know what you want to learn um, because I'm in the process of trying to narrow down courses to work on. And I put so much energy and time into these courses um, that it needs to be something that you guys are really going to get a lot out of for, for it to be worth it. So um, the more you guys can kind of give feedback and response to the specific stuff you want to learn in the specific software, um, whether it's game development, whether it's real-time development for virtual reality and automated reality applications, uh, whether it's uh, visual effects or filmmaking, um, there's there's so much stuff we can do with Blender. Uh, I love 3D illustration. I love talking about 3D illustration. I could do 100 courses on 3D illustration, uh, but I don't know if that's what everybody wants to learn. And so um, the more we start talking about that sort of stuff, the better off we're all gonna be. Because ultimately with the guild, what I wanna do is put everybody in a place where we're all kind of leveling up our skills together. You know, we, we're getting together and it isn't just me talking down to you or like, you know, trying to be this guru or whatever. Like it's literally us getting together and saying, you know what, we want to be better at what we're doing. And it's hard enough with, you know, work and everything else going on to find time to do this. And so the faster we can level up, the better we can do uh, our arts and move on to bigger goals and move forward in life and all that sort of stuff. And I think the fastest way to do that is together. Um, if we try to do it by ourselves, it just, it takes so much time to uncover those aha moments when you're by yourself. But the second you get two or three people together in a room and we're talking like this and we're able to focus on projects and things like that together, um, we start talking about solutions and we start talking about answers to problems. And all of a sudden we start coming up with ways to do things that other people haven't seen before. And that's where you really start learning. Getting into projects and doing things, that's where you learn stuff. Uh, you can watch a million tutorials and, and again, if you don't open Blender and you don't do stuff, it's not gonna matter. I mean, I, I've done this myself where I've, I've spent money or I've spent out tons of hours watching other people work. And just because I've seen hundreds of hours of people painting doesn't mean I know how to paint. You know, it takes sacrifice and it takes opening the software and doing it and sitting down and doing it. Um, so yeah, that's what I would encourage you guys to do. Uh, okay, so Lauren says, thank you. I will come up with an idea for a request. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. I'm really interested to hear uh, what you are trying to learn. And for everybody else listening right now, if you would like to leave me a comment on this video, either live right now or uh, later on, if you're watching this, definitely leave me a comment and let me know immediately what you want to learn. And uh, I'm going to be paying attention and watching. And uh, yeah, lots headed your way. I'm currently working on ideas for creating a 3D illustration course following this month's project. Uh, everything from concept art to, um, you know, basic planning, the workflow we're doing right now, sculpting objects, retopology, texturing, UV layouts, um, how to light stuff so that, you know, it looks moody and, and depending on how you do that with different lighting setups, different camera positions to get a certain vibe in a scene. Um, how to, and ultimately it's about how to tell a story because everything that we do, no matter if it's game development, uh, short animations, visual effects, whatever, the point is to tell a story. And if you can't learn how to do that, you're not gonna connect with people. And if you want people to, to get on and, and view your stuff on ArtStation or share your stuff on Instagram or, or follow you and all that sort of stuff, um, you have to put out compelling stuff. And compelling has to be compelling for them. It can't just be compelling for you, right? Um, and so I encourage you to work on stuff that interests you. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is learn how to take your work to the next level by implementing narrative. Um, no matter what you're doing, like everything I'm doing right now for this pipe is about 
having an object in front of you that tells a story. It's about holding this in your hands or seeing this in the illustration or whatever. And you see it once and you may look away, but something makes you take a second look. And at that point you start looking at the details and you go, oh, I know what that is. You know, I see what he did there. I see, I see the detail and it isn't just the detail, but it's purposeful detail. Like we put an octopus there because it's attacking the ship. And then we put a little man on the outside of the hole with a spear. And that, that tells the story that says what's happening. And it, it's more than just a ship that's a pipe that's sitting on a desk. It's, it's a hand carved object that has a lot of love and time and attention put into it. And all of the objects, hopefully in the 3D illustration this month, have pieces and, and sections of me that I've put into those objects through time and energy that when someone sees that and they start looking and deeper into the scene and they start really looking at all the details, they start to realize like, oh, okay, there's a point to this. Like it all kind of circles back around and I get, I get something from this. It isn't just a bunch of random objects sitting on a desk, right? Um, Okay, so I've got time for one more question. Lauren Davies says, what does UV layouts mean? Okay, so let me save where we are right now. I'm gonna switch my screen back so you guys can see this real fast. Okay, so this is where we got with the pipe tonight. Uh, not as far as I was hoping, but uh, far enough. So let's switch back to object mode. And I'm gonna turn off my mat cap here. Okay, so Lorian is asking what UV layouts are. So, let's split my window here. Go to the uh, UV image editor right here. And this is just a window that allows you to uh, preview your UV layouts or your um, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, uh, your UV layouts or your um, images in a window here that you have loaded in the Blender. So if we start looking at our objects in this scene, and I'm gonna move uh, these back to layer one. So the spoon right here has uh, UVs. So if I tab into edit mode, you can see that um, there's all the polygons here and then these little red edges that are called seams. So if you grab an edge and then uh, you go to the specials menu, uh, sorry, not specials menu, uh, edge menu, control E, you can mark a seam. And a seam is basically, you can think of this like taking scissors and cutting an object along this edge, okay? So I'm gonna clear this one, but I've cut uh, this object apart using these seams. And uh, so now if we look at this object in the UV layout, I'm gonna get rid of this image. You can see that we basically take in the spoon like it was a cardboard box, cut all the tape on the edges like it was a moving box and we've laid it out flat on paper. And so you can see sections of this. So this is the big scoop into the spoon. And these are all sections that have the sculpture and things like that. Now, I did this so that we can save this and open it up in something like Photoshop, and then I can paint on it. And so if I pull over some of my texture maps for the spoon, jump back to my textures here, I can jump over to spoon folder here. And if I show the spoon UVs, you can see that map saved. So now when I open this in a program like Substance or Photoshop, it's going to save all of the textures that I paint into this UV layout as images. And then Blender will know how to map all of those textures back onto the object. So think of it like cutting apart a cardboard box, laying it out flat, painting it so that you can see the whole thing all at once and then you tape it all back up together so that it's back into one 3D object, which is a cube. And that's the idea. So every single map that I'm using for the spoon here is saved with this layout 
as a separate image file. So this is ambient occlusion. These are all baked out of substance. This is the tarnish map that actually tells the spoon uh, which areas need to have the tarnish for the silver. Uh, so this is the black and white map we're using in cycles to drive that. And uh, yeah, so that's how that works. Uh, so U and V stand for uh, the same thing as like X, Y, Z coordinates. So um, V coordinates are sort of like vertical, like up and down, and U coordinates are horizontal. So if you were to say zero and one on the UV space, it would basically mean you're gonna be all the way over here on the right side. U and, a U and V coordinate of one and one would be up here on the upper right hand side. So zero starts down here, zero, zero. It's like X, Y coordinates. And then one, one is up here. And then one, zero would be, or zero, one would be up here. One, zero would be over here. Uh, and so that's the way that works. And uh, if you open up in, it'll show you uh, what those coordinates sort of look like based on what you have selected. And uh, so this, I guess this is based on uh, 200, 256 out of 256. Yeah, 255 out of 255. So not sure why that's not zero to one, but basically that's, uh, that's what your coordinates are for UVs. Uh, so yeah, that's what UV coordinates are. All right guys, uh, half an hour over at this point, so I, I gotta head out. But I thank you guys for tuning in tonight and I will be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central Time to continue working on the uh, pipe that we have here. Um, and Lorian says it's kind of like a Mercator cat map of the earth, right? Yes, it's sort of the same thing where we have to find a way to describe a 3D object on a 2D surface. So we have to find a way to unwrap it. And uh, it's the exact same thing. Uh, if you had to unwrap a sphere in 3D space, you'd have, to, you'd have a UV map that kind of looks similar to that. Uh, in terms of one of the solutions that she would use. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I will be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central and also Friday night. So uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'm gonna see if I can finish this up tomorrow before we get too far along. And uh, yeah, so I'll see you. Have a good night, guys.